G'day everyone and welcome to the Deep Space Communication Complex just outside Canberra. The road trip continues on this edition of Sci-Fi Weekly. So our complex is a part of NASA, we're part of NASA's Deep Space Network, we're one of only three stations in the world that has this important task and that's to provide all the communications to all the dozens of spacecraft that are out there exploring the solar system, visiting planets, moons, asteroids, comets, looking deep into space, other stars and galaxies, uh, watching our own star of course, our sun every day, and then a bunch of other spacecraft keeping a broad eye around our core in the universe, good old planet Earth. With most of the solar system moving below the ecliptic plane in the next few years, Titbinbilla is expanding and will become an even more integral part of the deep space communication network. There are so many spacecraft out there, we simply need more antennas to be able to talk to all these extra craft and you know NASA's budget is always tight and that's what funds the entire complex but none of the new antennas are new money. It's actually all money we've had to save over the last decade from our general budget so that we can afford this $110 million investment. So it's really about expanding the ability to communicate with the, the satellites um, in terms of there's more, more stuff happening at the same time? Yeah, well, if you take for example a place like Mars. Mars is the traffic jam of the solar system right now. There are seven spacecraft there, five in orbit, two on the surface. We've got another one on its way at the moment. There are many more missions planned over the next four or five years. We could have up to a dozen spacecraft exploring Mars by the end of this decade so needing this antenna time the extra dishes to be able to listen in on their signals and get the commands to those spacecraft is essential. So Glenn we're standing in front of the Honeysuckle Creek dish uh, it was moved uh, in the 80s when that site was decommissioned tell us a little bit about what this dish is famous for. Well probably most people know about the role of Australia in a particular space event and that was the Apollo 11 moon landing back in July 1969. Most people know that story because of the movie The Dish, talking about the Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales. Astronaut Neil Armstrong lands on the moon. People all over the world will be watching television pictures provided by the receiving dish in the town of Parkes. So what's this all about? We've got the moonwalk. Hey? The moonwalk? Why'd they pick us? Turns out it's the largest radio telescope in the southern hemisphere. But it's a movie rather than a documentary. Mm. Um, what actually happened on that day was pretty exciting. Um, we had several stations in Australia that were providing support to Apollo 11. Uh, there was a station at Carnarvon in Western Australia, there was our station here at Tibbenbilla, and there was Honeysuckle Creek, which is about 25 kilometres southwest of here. But the original plan by NASA was to actually use their dish in California to get those pictures, you know, to show their guys, two Americans walking on the moon, beating the Russians there, winning the space race. But they had a problem. When they received that signal from the moon, the picture that they got at the California station, which they sent to Houston, was unfortunately upside down. Currently it's upside down on our monitor, but we can make out a fair amount of detail. So that was a bit of a sort of a dull type of moment for, you know, for NASA. So they looked to Australia, of course. Now, they had the use of the Parkes radio telescope, but Parkes didn't have a picture at the critical moment. And that's because, and they depict this in the film, the moon hadn't risen high enough in their local skies yet, so they had to wait a little while before they were going to get a picture. So NASA looks to the Honeysuckle Creek station, and this dish here it was the smallest dish in the world, providing that communication at 26 metres. And so they had a picture, they had a great picture, and it was the right way up. NASA saw that on their screens, flicked the switch just in time, so that 600 million people around the world could witness Neil Armstrong taking his final few steps down the ladder, putting his left foot on the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So that switch break that we see uh, in those pictures that are immortalised in history now, uh, that switch break there is um, Houston switching from California to Honeysuckle Creek. Yeah, and one of the reasons the picture was actually upside down was because the guy who was the video technician at that station uh, actually called in sick that day and so his backup was on and his backup had forgotten to flick one particular switch out of many hundreds the right way around so that picture was upside down. The picture wasn't great quality either, it was very dark, contrast, the blacks were very 
black, white's very white, couldn't get a lot of detail. So yeah, the pictures coming from Honey Cycle Creek were beautiful, right way up, and that's what everybody watched. About eight and a half minutes into the broadcast, Park started to get a, a picture as the moon got higher in their skies and they could get that clean signal. So then up in Sydney at ABC TV studios, uh, the video technician up there spends a few minutes going Parks, Honeysuckle, Parks, Honeysuckle on his monitor and decides about eight and a half minutes in, yeah, Parks looks like it'll get a good picture, switches over. Neil's already on the moon, he's collecting samples, doing everything else and uh, Buzz is about to come out and they carry the rest of the moonwalk. So uh, Honeysuckle get on with its key job and that was keeping the astronauts alive, providing voice and data communication. Right, okay. Now that movie that was depicted uh, called The, the Dish, uh, which many people have seen yeah. around the world many times over, um, depicts a few, or creates a few myths, uh, doesn't it? It does. Uh, number one, we do not play cricket on dishes. <laughs> <laughs> That's an absolute. Um, back in 1969, the Parks dish was mainly just a, a steel wire mesh. You couldn't walk on it, let alone play cricket on it. Today its dish surface is a little bit more solid and for the movie they wanted to depict the actors in there showing the scale of the dish and one of them doing something. So the cricket idea came up. But uh, an interesting side note is that for our big dish here before it was built, that's the part where, that's the bit of ground where our station staff had their cricket pitch. So maybe they pinched the idea from us. <laughs> one of the truths that the movie did depict though was the fact that Aussies were running the parks station much like Tidbin Villa today. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Uh, the Parks Radio Telescope is of course part of the CSIRO, uh, their Astronomy and Space Science Division, still doing great work today in radio astronomy. And CSIRO is also our site contractor here, uh, managing the station on NASA's behalf. Uh, the people that work here, all Australian, it's an all Aussie team. Uh, we're regarded as the best in the world at what we do. Uh, we have 90 of some of the best engineers, technicians, spacecraft communication people anywhere. Uh, we work very closely with our colleagues at our sister stations. If we do something better than anybody else, then we go and train them how to do it. And, and another truth that I have to mention, we, we're standing obviously amongst, a, uh, amongst many sheep paddocks here. Um, there, is a very, there is a very good reason for that, isn't there? Yeah, um, we're in the middle of the farm, so you know, there are cows here and there are lots of sheep as well. And of course, you know, the parks dish, everybody's like, what's it doing in the middle of a sheep paddock? The reason why is because very few sheep have mobile phones. So we stay nice and radio quiet. And that's really important. We're in quiet, peaceful valleys like this. So the hills around us shield us from line of sight radio noise coming from you know, radios, televisions, mobile phones and so on. And we do ask people when they come into the valley to help us, to continue to listen for these little tiny signals we're trying to see from across the solar system by switching off or putting at least into flight mode their phones. So Glenn, Tibbin Villa is a, is a working station, there's a lot of research and, uh, and communication happening but it's also a place for visitors to come isn't it? Yeah that's absolutely right, the, the site operates 24-7 but we have our visitor centre, people can come along to, we're open every day except for Christmas Day 9 to 5 and it's totally free and they can learn a little bit more about the past, present and future of space exploration and the important work that we do here. Fantastic and there's also a cafe I believe with some pretty good food and, and coffee? Yeah, Moon Rock Cafe. You can't have a place like this without having the Moon Rock Cafe. And uh, yeah, they do great meals and uh, snacks and everything else. So come along, grab a coffee, sit down and relax and watch some of the biggest dishes in the world communicate with spacecraft hundreds of millions, billions of kilometres away. Nothing's more relaxing. Fantastic, Glenn. Thanks so much for the tour and uh, good luck with all of your future projects. Thanks very much. A huge thanks to Glenn Nagel at the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex for his time and the guided tour around the complex. It's absolutely fantastic to know that Aussies are playing a very crucial part in space exploration. From the entire road trip, it's a huge thanks to Mor uh, Boris and Mac from Iron Fest for having us as the media crew, bringing us down and getting the whole thing started. To Phil and all the professors at the Australian National University, thank you for your time. And of course, to my awesome crew, Liam and Keely, thank you so much for your 
your time and assistance. It was an amazing nine days and let's hope we can do it again sometime soon. An absolutely awesome road trip. But sadly, Sci-Fi Weekly as the brand is coming to a close. The looming deadline is just too much for me to bear. So I'm gonna put all of my effort into the Trek Zone Spotlight. But don't worry, the same great content will be coming uh, to the Trek Zone Spotlight. Even this week, Axanar's Rob Burnett, Star Trek continues Vic Mignogna, and looking a little bit further down the road, the Star Trek Beyond red carpet premiere down in Sydney are all coming up. They'll be Trek Zone Spotlight podcasts releasing on the same place at podcasts.trekzone.org. Be sure to check out all of these social media channels to keep in the loop so you don't miss a thing. I'm Matt Miller. Thank you so much for your support over the past six months here for Sci-Fi Weekly. Uh, from me now, though, it's bye.